So this is a public um, education presentation produced by Arlington Alexandria, the Arlington Alexandria unit of the Virginia Cooperative Extension. Uh, it was established to uh, bring you public education and information on uh, gardening practices uh, uh, developed by Virginia Tech and Virginia State University, uh, Virginia's two land grant uh, universities. Uh, the Master Gardens of Northern Virginia are a nonprofit 501c3 organization which uh, supports Virginia, uh, the uh, Arlington and Alexandria unit of VCE. Uh, this is our website. If you write on, don't write down anything else on this presentation, please write down this. This is how you can get in touch with us to get uh, more information for uh, the program, a schedule of programs that we do. And we can also communicate with us at currently through email. Uh, we have a help desk every day, Monday th uh, through Friday from nine to 12 in the morning. And you can email uh, this address for information on gardening help. You can send emails of, uh, of photos of, uh, of an issue you might have. So these are two sites that are important for you to know about. Okay, now on to pruning. The pruning is the deliberate act of wounding a plant to achieve a desired result. Yes, I know wounding sounds really scary, but don't worry because plants, unlike humans, regenerate. Dormant buds are stimulated into growth by hormones when we cut a plant. Today we will cover pruning tools, why we prune, when to prune, and how to prune. Okay, let's talk about tools first. These are the tools that you will be using. Hand clippers. A bypass pruner looks somewhat like a pair of scissors. The two blades pass each other and they are best for using on live or green wood. Anvil pruners have one sharp uh, side and which cuts down onto a flat surface, the anvil, and they work better with uh, pr pruning dead wood. Uh, you need, if you're pruning a larger size branch, then you can handle with a hand pruner. You can use the loppers and they will cut a branch up to about one and three quarters inch in di diameter. Uh, pruning saws, several different types. The bow saw is good for pruning a large branch, but with this big handle, it's not very convenient for uh, getting into a small space where you can use a smaller hand uh, saw. And the pole pruners are basically, whoops, the same um, type of instrument. They're just fixed onto a long pole. Some of them also have a, um, a, a cutting, uh, like a clipper on the other side that you can use to reach uh, branches that are higher up uh, from the ground. You also will need something to sharpen your tools with. You can get it. This is a diamond uh, uh, sharpener that you can buy very cheaply. And this is a larger file sharpener. Other tools you need are gloves and especially leather gloves if you're going to be doing something that's thorny or sharp and goggles because especially when you're sawing, you, and even when you're reaching down into a plant, there's a good possibility of hurting your eye. So be safe. Um, we recommend that you buy the best quality that you can afford. Keep them clean, dry, and sharp. And clean them between each use with several products. VCE recommends either Lysol, Full either full strength up to 10% dilution, alcohol at a 70% solution or higher, Listerine, full strength. Do not use chlorine bleach or pine saw. They're very harsh and they will damage your tools. So, and after you've cleaned them, oil them with a very light oil. 
and that will keep your tools in good shape. Now we're moving on to the actual, why do we prune? Why do we go out there and, and subject our plants to this? Because actually it improves their health. First, you're going to be removing dead, damaged or diseased wood. Obviously, the, those are all places where insects or uh, other diseases can get into the and infect the plant. You want to promote healthy growth and you want to improve air circulation. This may seem a little odd, but fungus diseases are very common in our plants, especially here in uh, Virginia. And improving the circulation of air through the whole body of your plant is very important for uh, reducing those fungus diseases. After you've approved for health, uh, pruned for health, then you prune for appearance to either reduce the size of the, of the plant or perhaps to produce a special effect for, uh, such as in topiary or um, other kinds of ornamental effects. But we're going to concentrate really on the basics here. And you see our little mantra, right plant, right place down at the bottom. There's a reason for that. Uh, if you are finding yourself pruning a plant more than once a year, you might want to consider whether you really want that plant or at least not in that, do you want it in that place? There are plants that will fit in almost any place. If you have a narrow space beside your door that you want to put a plant in, that's fine. But pick a plant that's tall and thin, like a sky pencil holly or a uh, skyrocket uh, juniper. If you plant something that's going to grow to six or eight feet wide, you're going to be cutting it back constantly. It's not good for the plant and it's a big pain for you. All right. So what are our general pruning goals when we go out there with our clippers and our saw? First thing we're going to do is get rid of the dead, damaged, and diseased branches. This is the most important thing for you to do, and you can do it at any time of the year. This eliminates the uh, vector for disease into your uh, plant, and it also prevents dead, dead branches from falling down in your yard and possibly on you. So that's the first thing you're going to do. Second thing, remove overlapping and crossing branches. Now, why would you want to do that? Mainly, with the crossing branches where they actually rub against each other, that rubbing motion in the front caused by the wind is going to cause the branch, the bark to um, rub away, and that will be a perfect place for diseases and insects to uh, infect your plant. The overlapping branches, that's just a, uh, a situation where the branches are too tightly uh, crossed in the middle of the plant and they are going to cause the, uh, the air to circulation to be less and they're going to prevent sunlight from coming into the middle of your plant and uh, give it, helping your plant and, and preventing the photosynthesis and the growth of your plants. And the third and this is what this is what opens your plant to the, to air and sun, so the plants can grow more uh, efficiently and they will be more healthy. And finally, what you're going to do is prune to the natural form of a plant. Every plant has a way that they naturally grow. If you've ever seen a forsythia, the, the yellow shrubs that are grow, uh, blooming right now. They start at a narrow place in the, at, the, at the base of at the ground and grow out like a fountain. If you uh, look at a box bush, they usually make a, a rounded form, almost sometimes, sometimes a little bit like a cloud. Everything has a natural form, and if you prune to that natural form, you will have a more attractive plant and it will grow and you will do much less pruning. 
This is an azalea that's been pruned to its natural form. You can see that it's loose and, and, and um, oval, slightly oval in shape. This is an azalea, this white stuff, that has been sheared to match the uh, bushes next to it. What happens here is that you lose that attractive natural form and you create a great deal of um, growth right at the edge of the plant and not any growth and no leaves in the center of the plant. So look up. If you don't know what the natural form of your plant should be, there are resources, there are books, there are websites that will give you an illustration of the plant that you're thinking of buying. And you can um, see how it should look when it's growing in this uh, natural way. And before you go to the nursery and buy a plant, you should know the size of the space you're looking, uh, you're, you're thinking of putting it, how big the plant will grow, grow, and then you can make an informed choice and will have to do much less pruning. Now, this is a biggie. When do we prune? Remember, one of the things that's most important to know here is that when you prune a plant, remember we talked about the hormones that make the plant grow? These, whenever you cut a plant, that will stimulate the hormones right below the cut to shoot out new growth. And what you want to do when you're pruning is to um, uh, be sure that you um, prune at the right time so you're not harming the plant, but you're helping the plant. Now this, this discussion is based on the timings are based on current uh, climate conditions and they may change as our weather possibly or our climate changes, but right now this is, this is the recommendations for this area in Northern Virginia. Okay, the black area here is the area time that we do not want to prune plants. And the reason for that is, remember you're, when you cut the plant, it stimulates growth. If you cut the plant as late as October, it will immediately start pushing out new growth, new tender growth. And that tender growth, by the time we hit December, will not have heart, uh, made itself a strong enough bark covering that it will be susceptible to dying in the frost. It will get fr frozen and, and, and will free, die back. And that will be a, a source of stress for the plant. It's a source for disease and insects. So this is the time that we do not prune, okay? The pink slice down here is when we prune Plants, plants that bloom in the spring. Starts about June 1st and it goes until about mid-August. And the reason why we plant and prune then is that we want to allow the, the spring blooming plants to have their bloom and then as soon as they finish blooming in about two or three weeks or to a month after they finish blooming, they start forming buds for the next year. So if you go out and look at your um, cherry tree that's just finishing blooming, in about a few weeks, the flowers will drop off, but it will start creating new buds for next year. If you put prune too early on that uh, tree, it will uh, you'll prune off some of the flowers. So up here in the green uh, wedge is where we prune those uh, plants that uh, bloom in the summer. Summer bloomers are um, things like uh, Rose of Sharon, li uh, not lilacs, Rose of Sharon, crepe myrtle, butterfly bush, and roses. So if you prune here, you can prune in early in the, in, the, in the spring because those plants form their buds 
in the same year that they bloom. So they're, 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 they're going to shoot out new growth, make buds, and then bloom down here in this period of time. So that's, this is a good time to prune and, and, and shape your buds, your, uh, your summer bloomers. So um, we call, we, we're, we're, we're telling you this about when they bloom because that's an easy time for people to um, uh, remember the, these two basic rules. But actually, it's based on when the plants make their buds. If they form their buds on old growth, then, we, then they bloom here and we prune them there. If we, they form their buds on new growth, they form their, their buds here and, and bloom down here. So that the opposite, the, the, the pruning time is almost opposite the blooming time. Is everybody straight on that one? Okay, this is the time you prune for the prune for the summer bloomers. This is the time you prune for the spring bloomers. And you don't prune, prune here at all. You start pruning when it gets really cold and the plants are fully dormant. One advantage of doing it here in the winter time is that you can see it. Um, the, the leaves are off the, the trees and the shrubs and you can see their branch structure very clearly and that makes it easier to prune out those crossing branches and see it finding the dead branches and, and, and shaping the, the plant attractively. Um, Molly? Yes. Could you speak a little bit more about the June 1st rule? We've had a question here. Okay, June 1st rule, this is about the, the, the June 1st is about the spot where we switch from pruning uh, for, for the summer bloomers and, and plume, pruning for the um, uh, spring bloomers. That's, that's your, your break time. But you can also, if you're really not sure, you can just look at your plant and say, and if, if it's bloomed about two weeks to a month after it's bloomed, then you can prune it. That's, that's, that's another way of looking at it. So it's, it, this is not a, a, a huge rule. It's just kind of the switch over between prun pruning the uh, spring bloomers and pruning the summer bloomers. Does that help? Are there any other questions on this? This is important. So I want to give you time to, to absorb it. If you don't, if the plant doesn't create half flowers or you don't care about the flowers, if they're very small, then it really doesn't matter. Then you can prune it at either time. We have this, we have this pruning schedule mostly for the, for the flowering plants so that you don't lose your, um, your flowers. But this rule over here is, is true always that you don't prune in from, from, middle of August up through January when it gets uh, really solidly cold. Okay. Are there other questions at this point? Hearing none, we are going to go. Oh, there's one other point. There are a few plants that we don't bloom in the, uh, the prune in the spring, mostly trees. And those are sugar maples, walnuts, birches, and a plant called, a tree called yellowwood, which is not so common around here. And the main reason why we don't prune them is that they are, have a very heavy sap run in the spring. Everybody knows about sugar maples, but birches and um, walnuts also have a, a very heavy flow of sap in the, um, in the springtime. And if you prune then, you will have the, the sap will just simply run right down the trunk of the tree. It's not very attractive. It actually doesn't harm the tree, but most people wait until a little later to prune those so that we don't have that issue. Okay, the uh, Virginia Tech has published calendars of um, when to prune different types of trees and shrubs, and they break it down by very specific um, 
by each type of plant and when, when is the best place to time to prune them. And if you're not sure, one very confusing group of plants is the hydrangeas. And that's because some of them bloom in the summer and some of them bloom in the spring. So you have to know which category your hydrangea is in in order to prune it correctly. Uh, but the, so if you want to get into a little more detail on a specific plant, you can look up those um, uh, Virginia Tech uh, uh, publications and they will tell you. Do you want to share them with people, Kirsten, or do you want to, uh, should we just move on and do it at the end? Oops. <laughs> Why don't you talk about the evergreens on the next slide first? Okay. Okay. So, um, moving on. Evergreens. Generally speaking, the winter is the best time to prune evergreens. Um, there are some other times you can do it, and you can always do it if you have a broken or a uh, damaged branch. If there's a thunderstorm or a truck runs into your tree and, and uh, breaks off a branch, you always want to prune it off right away so that um, disease doesn't get into the branch or that it doesn't cause some damage to you or your home. So that, that's, uh, these other rules are just for ornamental value, but for safety and uh, uh, taking care of your plant, if, if the plant is damaged, you always take the branch off. Okay, so this is this same window, maybe even starting in December because things are getting cold much later than they used to. So this is the best time to prune your evergreens. And you can, we'll show you how to look up the VCE publication. Okay. Yeah. There was a very um, good question about um, whether or not um, pruning and particularly pruning of birches attracts birch spores. Say that again? Pruning for what? The question is about whether or not pruning and the injury that we cause to trees causes, makes an attraction to uh, insects that might be attracted to the trees or to the sap. Hmm. Tree, uh, I, would, um, I don't I know the specific answer to that. I'll be very honest. I um, I could see that the sap would very, be very attractive to insects, but whether that it's whether it's the boar interest uh, insects, I'm not sure. Are you familiar with that one? Whoops. Well, I just wanted to comment that in general, many plants you know, do send out distress signals and uh, pruning is, is no different from any other kind of distress signal that can happen. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm gonna to try to figure out how to turn this down here. So what happens is that um, we're, we're trying to do the pruning at a time when the tree is less likely to take a long time to recover from that injury and, um, and that the um, the sap won't be flowing and that those distress signals and pheromones aren't being um, broadcast to the insects. Um, I think what we're, what we're also seeing is that, you know, last year's trees um, in Alexandria that were suffered so badly, so um, we had such extraordinary death from, from the um, oak decline. You know, they were, they were under stress and because they were under stress, they attracted a lot of poor insects that, that did hasten the process. Uh, they weren't the primary cause of death, but they were, they were certainly did not help. Um, after pruning again, uh, we have a um, deciduous pr tree pruning calendar up here right now. And as Molly was saying, it organizes the information in a slightly different way. Uh, we have, um, um, for instance, the birches right here on the, on the left side, um, they are suggesting that um, the best time to prune them, and the icon is up here, the best time to prune has this little heart-shaped, leaf-shaped, whatever that is, icon there, um, is in January. But after that, okay, through July, they're saying don't prune at all unless there's some kind of defect, okay? Mm -hmm. 
there's a storm and the birch gets injured, absolutely, you want to be removing any kind of disease or dying wood. But other than that, you want to avoid pruning that particular kind of tree at that time. Um, this is um, a publication that is available to you, 430460PDF. I will put this in the, um, in the chat box for you. Right. Molly, do you want to say anything else about this chart? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, they run, this calendar runs, you know, linearly. Uh, the calendar that we put up is a circle, which to me is a little bit easier to see where on the, um, you know, procession of months that uh, because often the, the best pruning time, as you can see, is from the end of the year to the and then in the beginning of the year, and then it's and it's cut in half. But um, certainly going back to the birches, if if uh, you're concerned about uh, attracting insects, then pruning in the dormant time in the in the winter would be the best time to, to prune before before the sap would start to run. Okay, here's the shrub pruning calendar. I'm from Virginia Tech, and again, you can see that many of the ideal times for pruning shrubs absolutely depend on what their blooming time is. Here you have azalea, for instance. Molly talked about azalea, azalea quite a bit, and of course, they're blooming in here. Some and of them are blooming right now, in my neighborhood, uh, anyway. Yes. So and so the ideal time to prune them is in here right after they've already finished prune, blooming. And you can see that's true of all of these spring flowering shrubs. Now uh, we have, now we have a, oh, sorry, Kirsten, go ahead. And if you go down here and you look at these guys, um, you've got cherry law, clethra, the toniaster, crepe myrtle. These are all summer bloomers. And these are plants that want to be pruned in the early spring, just as the new growth is starting, because we know that they're gonna bloom on, on um, new growth. On the new wood, right. Going back to the azaleas, we've got a new wrinkle because the uh, plant growers have developed now azaleas and a couple of other um, shrubs that were used to be only summer bloomer, uh, spring bloomers, and now they have another secondary bloom later in the year, which makes them have a more attractive, uh, you know, highlight uh, in your yard a longer season for that, but it also makes it much trickier for pruning. And I believe the advice is to still follow this um, this chart, but perhaps prune a little bit more lightly. And you could always deadhead off just the dead flowers without cutting more deeply into the, um, the shrub itself. Now that we've talked about when, we can talk about how. And the, here we get into different types of cuts. This is not so much, a, you could use any tool, you could use your hand clippers, you could use the lopping shears, you could use the saw. That's not the type of cut we're talking about. We're talking about how you actually cut into the plant. So using any one of your uh, tools, there's a thinning cut, which we're going to describe these all in a minute. The thinning cut promotes the growth of the plant of, throughout the plant. It's, it's, a, it's a cut that, um, uh, actually thins out the, the plant but makes it grow throughout. A heading cut directs the growth to a specific area of the plant. If you have a plant that maybe was shaded by a, another bush and then you took that bush out and now you want your the one that's left to be fuller, you would use a heading cut in order to create that effect. Uh, the third cut is a shearing cut which is the first step that you use on hedges. Now this is often done with electric hedge clippers. Notice that we did not have any electric tools or mechanical tools in our first slide because we're not really recommending those that much for um, amateurs. But many people do use hedge clippers, but if you do shearing, that's not your final step. Um, and finally, rejuvenation, which is basically the last resort in trying to bring back a shrub that is in fairly deep trouble. And finally, we're going to talk about specific cuts on trees. There's a uh, uh, 
cuts that we do in order to improve the growth of the tree. Oops, that wasn't intended. There's the one third rule, which I'll go into in a great deal more detail later on, and also the three cut method. These are both for removing large branches for trees. So let's go on to the thinning cut. Um, it's used on, on single and multi-stemmed um, uh, trees and shrubs. For uh, a thinning cut, what you do is cut down to where the branch, can you see the little dotted lines, that little ghostly branch there? It goes all the way down to here. And what they have, the person has done is cut it all the way back to it where it joins a larger branch or stem. And this is important. This is how you make a thinning cut. If you do it like that, if you bring your cut all the way, follow the stem all the way back to the, to the next big branch and cut there, you will not create a great deal of growth. It does not stimulate the hormones as, I, uh, as usually happens because you, you go all the way, when you go all the way back there, this is the way that you open the tree or the plant up to get more light and more sun going all the way down into the, into the inside of the, of the plant so that uh, it stimulates then new leaves all up and down the branches. Um, very important for um, making an attractive shape, for improving the health of the plant because it's getting more sunlight, it's getting more photosynthesis, and it is able to grow better. Uh, very important for health, okay? For multi-stemmed shrubs especially, although there are some multi-stemmed trees also, uh, for Scythia and Nandina are part two of the very common multi-stem shrubs. Um, what we do is cut now instead of just, you can cut off back to a branch, but usually people will, will cut all the way down to the very bottom because these plants, as you can see, their natural growth habit is to shoot up many vertical stems from, from the ground. So what you want to do is cut down into the plant at the bottom and take out up to possibly a third of the stems that are currently existing and space them out around the plant. Take some from the center, take some from the sides. And again, you're opening up the plant up onto um, light and air to prevent diseases and to help it have more growth through the center of the plant. Some plants just keep shooting out branches from the base every year. Forsythias will do this, lilacs will do this, and they get very, very overgrown. So the idea is to clear, clear out the older stems especially and to allow new stems that will grow better and, and also probably bloom better. So that is your, how you do a thinning cut with the older stems first. Okay, heading cuts. When you're doing a heading cut, you're cutting a branch back, but you're not cutting all the way back to the next connecting um, branch. You can see how on this, on this uh, example on the left, the cuts are being made above the junction of the, of the stem. So there is still some, some stem left. And what you're doing here is when you cut that way, you are stimulating the hormones and the plant will put out a great deal of growth right at the point where you cut, made that cut. Now you can direct the growth a little bit um, as you go. Let's see if I can get, if and what you normally want to do is cut to an outward facing bud. And why is that? Because that outward facing bud, let's say there's a bud right there, that means a branch will grow out this way. If you cut to the bud that's over here, the branch will grow up 
into the into the center of the shrub and that's what we're trying to avoid because that blocks that branch will block the light all the way down here in the, to this part of the um, of the shrub and there will up the it will block the, the uh, light to the leaves and cut off the photosynthesis so you're trying always trying to keep your shrub open in the center and ha to have a good airflow there so um, you also want to stagger the height of the cuts you don't want to take a, a ch uh, chain stall and just go zoop like this but you want to um, make different height cuts and also form follow the form of the plant so that it looks attractive and looks natural. You want to bury the cuts in the body of the plant. In other words, reach down in. Don't just cut right across the outside because that will stimulate growth all around the outside. You'll get a thin skin of very bushy growth around the outside and nothing in the middle. But if you cut down into the center of the plant, down to um, and then cut, then you will have a uh, much more natural look and you will have better growth. And again, you only cut probably one third of the volume of the plant. There's a lot of one thirds in this in pruning. And finally, um, down at the bottom here we have, oh yes, combining the heading and the thinning cuts, cuts on mounding shrubs and so that you have both you're, you're both shaping the uh, direction of the growth and you're also creating a little bit more growth here and there to make a very nice looking plant. Now, when you're making heading cuts, when you cut, don't leave a stub like this at the end of where you cut. That will never regenerate, that will die, and it's just a very perfect avenue for, for uh, diseases and pathogens. So you cut right down to, to the uh, to the uh, flush with with the, with the major stem. He, this again shows there's there's buds on both sides, and you want to cut down to just above the bud, so that that bud can develop. But the, but the stub here will never will never develop any other any other leaves. It'll just sit there looking dead. Okay, when you're cutting hedges. If you're shearing, especially along the top, use a guideline. Uh, it's very difficult, especially if the ground is at all irregular, to keep a nice even top like this if you don't do something like that. You have to put a stake in at each end of the hedge, run a string along at the height that you want your uh, shrub, uh, your hedge eventually to be, and then you can get a little there's a little lot what they call line levels that will hang on that string and will sh and then you can adjust your string till your line is level across the whole run of the whole run of the shrub and then you can cut along that line and have a nice straight top but the other thing that's most even more important is to make sure that you cut the bottom wider than the top and if you don't do that this is what you get because the top if the top is wider than the bottom, the top shades the um, bottom uh, branches and they just, if they don't get sun, they stop growing. And then the leaves drop off and you get little leggy lollipops like that. So um, you want to make sure that, you, that the plant gets light all the way down to the bottom of the plant and also rain, the, the, the light, the, the water can get, get to it. So this is very important. When you, when you finish uh, doing that uh, uh, pruning, you need to follow that pruning with heading and thinning cuts. For, if you cut straight across, you've left a lot of stubs. You've left a lot of, um, you've just cut straight no matter where you were, where the branches were. So you have to go back and remove those stubs. You should, ideally, you would even go back and cut down into the plant at some points to allow more light in so that there is more uh, foliage in the interior of the plant. It won't be now as straight as a, as a wall, but it will be a much more healthy plant. 
Okay. Rejuvenation planting. Remember we said this is desperation time. If you have a plant that got is so overgrown you can't even get into the middle of it to do that kind of um, thinning down to the bottom that we suggested for a, for a multi-stem shrub. If it got run over by a truck, if it got fallen on by a, a, a limb that, that, that came down from a tree above, um, ice has, has completely crushed it. This is something you can try. You don't always get 100% results, I'll tell you that right now. But it's, if it's a plant you like, you might decide that it's worth trying before you um, just dig it out and put something else in. You can do it on some single set of shrubs, not all. Holly will respond well to this. Laurel will respond well. Some will not. So do some research. Call us up at the help desk and ask us whether we, if this is one of the years, is one of the uh, plants that you can try. But um, some plants, if you cut them off, that's that's it. They were not going to grow again. Uh, you would cut six to eight inch, eight inches above the ground, leave, leave some trunks like this, and if it's a, a, an appropriate shrub, it will send out new growth from all of those places. Okay, if it's a multi-stemmed um, shrub, like forsythia and lilacs and hydrangeas, this works very well on multi-stem shrubs because they're more used to regenerating from the ground. You can cut them to the ground. Instead of cutting one third, you just cut everything. Cut them all down and they will respond usually very energetically. You, pro you will then need to go back after they have sent up a lot of new growth and thin that new growth. You don't want 24 stems coming up, perhaps you want eight. And so you can selectively prune the, uh, to the the ones that are too close together or too uh, thin or, or look weak uh, back down to the ground. And then you will have a nice shrub that will bloom well next year. Um, I have seen this done. It does work. And actually sometimes it works, your, the plant that you wind up with looks better than a plant that you did half-hearted pruning with because you were afraid to cut it all the way down. But um, you do have to, especially with a single stem shrub, you have to know whether it will work for that. And again, we're emphasizing right plant, right place. If the shrub is too big, perhaps it should never have been there in the first place and you want to research something else. It's okay to move your shrubs around. Uh, I've done it. Molly, I, mm -hmm. excuse me, before you move Back to this picture of the um, hedge, please. The hedge, okay. Sorry. Uh, yep. Okay, if I can figure out how to get, make this do it. Let's go. Yeah, there you go. I thought I, I thought I had this. It, it has to. It has to race everything first. There okay. We go. One of the questions that I get asked a lot is how do I how do I rejuvenate a hedge? Mm-hmm. And um, the the it's it's not a pretty picture. I'll tell you what. Yeah. <laughs> um, because essentially you have to cut the top without cutting the bottom. And in the example of the picture that has been provided on the slideshow, you yes. are simply cutting these down to the ground, as Molly just described yeah. in yeah. the rejuvenation pruning technique. Right. But in a in a shrub that is a uh, hedge that is um, you know wider than this one and maybe already has some branches near the bottom, it just doesn't have very much money leaves near the bottom. Mm -hmm. If you will start pruning about waist high and only prune up from there, but not anything below that. And if you repeat that for a number of years and gradually change the shape from the V shape, which is on the right-hand side of the diagram, mm -hmm. to the A shape, which is on the left-hand side of the diagram, you will get rejuvenated growth near the bottom. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. 
most hedge uh, shrubs that are used for hedges respond well to very heavy pruning. They're, that's why they are, they're used for that because like privet and laurels and what have you, they, they, they bounce back very quickly. But there's a period of time right after you've done, because you're cutting deeply into beyond where there are any leaves and they're going to look like they're dead. They're going to look a mess for a while. So you have to be willing to put up with that in order to really rejuvenate. So we have two questions here. One of them is, um, would mulching or compost be helpful for a plant that is cut so drastically? Um, I would say compost. I mulching is mulching just kind of preserves the uh, the moisture in the in the in the and, and has some organic thing. I don't know that that would make the hugest amount of difference. You, you want to make sure you've got, you're continuing good cultural practices, that it's watered on a regular basis, that it uh, gets at least some nutrients and whatever. But it's, and, cer and certainly you want to avoid over composting or over mulching because that would do more harm than good. Yeah. Um, so the other question we have here is about um, boxwoods. Um, yeah. And the question is, I have basswoods that are gradually declining one at a time. Um, is it worth trying to save them with rejuvenation pruning? Um, I think I would research first to see what the problem is. You say the boxwoods are, are, are dying? Is that the issue? Um, Martha, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question. Okay. Or maybe you can unmute yourself. Let me see if I can do that. The issue is going to be, I believe, that um, that if you if your plants are not growing vigorously, mm -hmm. you cannot do heavy duty, you know, pruning on them and expect them to come back. That might be the kiss of death, especially with the boxwood, which is not that. It's a much slower grower than something like a privet or a laurel. I saw some boxwoods at River Farm that they didn't ha have rejuvenation pruning. They did have very, uh, they, they, they were slowly doing very uh, careful um, cuts deep into the shrub to try to, uh, to, to pr uh, open up more, more light into the shrub. But they did it at a much slower pace than, than, than you would do with a, with a hedging plant because boxes grow very slowly. And um, so it, it's, a, it's a careful process. Um, the other thing is if you've got, if the, the boxes are dying or sh you know, showing uh, the grounding and things like that, I would want to investigate what that was because you may have an issue that, that uh, if it's a disease issue, pruning's not not really going to solve it. Um, it, it, it uh, you can cut off the dead branch, but if, if, the, if the disease is spread through the whole plant, that's not really going to solve the problem. Uh, did you have anything more to add to that, Kirsten? Okay, no. Um, Martha, are you still there? No. Okay. Um, I go on, go ahead and go on. Okay. Alrighty, so now we're going on to, okay, we did rejuvenation, and now we're on to conifers. Uh, process is about the same. Conifers have, are grow in two different ways. There's the world branch kind, like this, where the, where the needles come out all around the, the stem in a, in a, in a spiral, in a whirl, that's all I can say pines, spruces, things like that. If you want to thin them, you use the normal thinning cuts, cutting down to the, uh, the next branch. Um, if you want to head them, you can pinch off the pencils. This is the, the little growth thing that comes out at the, at, the, um, at the very end of the branch. And if you just, and you can do it by hand, you don't even have to use shears if you don't want to, break that off it stimulates growth with the hormones right around and will send out several little, uh, several branches right around but the part at the end of the branch. Okay. Um, random branched 
jun uh, uh, conifers like uh, junipers, arborvitae, what else am I thinking of right now? You can prune them just as you do the deciduous one. You can do the thinning branches, cuts right down, it would be down to the, uh, to the, where it joins the next branch. If you do a heading cut, if you're just cutting back, but not all the way to the, um, uh, um, to the, um, the next branch, you have to be careful not to cut beyond the point where it's showing green growth. If you cut between this last um, spray of needles and, and the next branch, you're going to leave a stub and that stub will not regenerate. You can cut up here, you can cut up here, you can cut up here, but if you cut all the way down here, it's not going to regenerate. If you cut in any of these other places, it will send off outgrowth uh, above that point. So when they say don't cut cutting, don't cut beyond the green, that's what they're talking about. That don't go down into just that uh, naked branch. Okay, um, these are world needled conifers and you can see the little um, growing point right here that you can prune off and then get um, a um, more growth right, right from that point. This is what the uh, Christmas tree growers do to make those beautiful conical uh, shaped um, trees. Okay, this is, now we're moving on to trees. And if you buy a tree or if you have a young tree, these are some things to look for before you buy it. And also some things you can do to improve your tree if, um, if you've already got one or you didn't, weren't checking this at the time that you bought it. The optimum angle of attachment of the branches to the trunk is between 45 and 60 degrees. So that's the, the, the angle at which there is the most strength in the attachment. If, it's, if the branch is a, a very narrow crotch, narrower than 45 degrees, that's not a strong branch that when the branches and the trunk grow, they are pushing against each other and, the, and there's, there's not enough space for that growth to happen. And if they are greater than 60 degrees, if they're like out straight or even drooping, that puts too much weight as, as the branch grows on that on this joint. And it, it's, a, it's a point where it will um, possibly uh, tend to break. So you want to try prune off the ones that are very close to to the to the to the trunk, or very very um, uh, up to uh, yes up to its angle. Also, look at the tree if you can from above. You might have to get underneath it and look up from underneath if it's a really big tree. But try to make sure that the the branches are the weight is evenly distributed all around the tree. That also is very important as the tree grows. Okay. So, um, how to correct growth as the tr as the tree gets older, larger? You want to. Re uh, there's some things you want to remove, and there's some things you want to encourage. Two things you want to remove are extra growth if it comes up from the ground like this it's called a sucker and some trees are very prone to this to to creating uh, shooting up new growth from the um from the uh ground right around the base of the trunk it's not very attractive and it's usually weak wood and uh just takes uh, uh strength from the tree itself so uh generally those are removed as soon as they appear a water sprout is the same thing as a sucker, but it's up off of a branch. And usually you can tell it's growing straight up vertically. Again, it pulls a lot of strength from the tree. And uh, trees often develop these when they're being stressed. If they've had some damage, they, um, their, res their response is to push out a whole lot of new growth, but it's not good healthy growth or uh, so usually that's uh, removed. 
if there are many, many, many of them, you might want to do it maybe a third at a time over several months because if you remove too much, it might just encourage the tree to make more. Um, trees have a natural leader. You see how this tree grows up from the, the bottom to the top and right up straight. If that, and you, when you buy a tree, you should make sure that it has a very straight natural leader like this. If it's got what's called a double leader, where there are two of them side by side, that's not a good thing. If you're stuck with a young tree like that, take off one of the leaders and the other one will, will definitely uh, develop and um, uh, be much healthier. This, this leader drives the whole development of the tree, so it's extremely important. If the leader is, whoops, if the leader is damaged somehow by um, wind damage or another tree falling or something like this, it's, it's very stressful for the tree. Another branch will try to become the leader and you can help it do that with some judicious pruning, but it's never a good thing for your tree. Um, Molly? Yes. We have one question just came in. I have a young pin oak. Some of its lower branches are interfering with my front walkway. Mm -hmm. Pin oak. Uh-huh. Yes. When can I cut them back? Okay. And if I cut them back, do I also have to cut them back to the trunk? Um, yes, pin oaks, uh, that's one of the interesting things about the, them, that they're not, they, they, as they grow, their lower branches tend to naturally droop like that. And if they're a, a problem along the walkway, I, w I would say yes, cut them back. And I would say yes, cut them back to the trunk. Um, it would look better, actually and it will heighten the, the, the growth of the, the canopy above the sidewalk. And we'll get into how to do that in just a few minutes. Okay. Uh, okay, so when you're cutting, this is very important for trees, cut up to and not into the branch collar or bark ridge. As this is, this is, the, this is the trunk of the tree here this is the, a branch coming out and this tissue right here and it's often rough and slightly raised is called the bark ridge it's almost like in geology when when um two uh plates are pushing together and they push the the the, the, the land up into to form a mountain it almost looks like that in very sm much more miniature form but that because the, both the bark of the, of the branch and the bark of the trunk are growing toward each other and it pushes up this bark ridge. The branch collar goes all the way around the, the limb. There's a, each, each branch has a collar. Some of them are easier to see than others, but those are, it's very important not to cut into that branch collar. And we'll see, okay, here's a picture of the branch collar right here. Do you see how rough it is right there? And that, so if you were cutting, you would cut, the, the final cut should be right outside that branch collar. And the reason that you do that is that trees, trees don't heal, but they seal. And if you leave that branch collar intact, it will grow over the wound and it will cut, uh, uh, cover, cover the, the, the uh, uh, exposed area and seal the tree off from, from insects and pathogens. This is actually where a branch was removed. And that branch collar has completely sealed over that, um, that cut. Here's another place where the cut was made. And here's the branch collar. It's in the process of doing exactly the same thing. It hasn't finished yet. It takes a while, but uh, trees will seal themselves and, um, and rejuvenate. Now, what you don't do is put on um, any kind of uh, sealant yourself onto that. Any kind of, used to be tar and then people used paint and I don't know, all kinds of things. Research has shown that that is actually more harmful for the, tr for the tree, that it seals in moisture and causes rot down into the, into the interior of the tree. So leave it open, exposed to the air, 
but don't damage the tree's nat natural bandage, which is this branch collar, so that it can heal itself. Okay, all right, now here's how to do the actual cut. What we call the three cut method. It, um, you do this anytime that you have to cut something that you can't take off with one cut with either a, a, a pair of hand pruners or, or loppers. If you have to use something bigger than that, usually a saw, then you should be doing this so that you don't uh, damage the tree. And we'll show you what happens when you don't do that in a minute. But here's the, pro the process with it. This is your branch going out. It's either dead or it's not where you need it to be. It Maybe it's damaged on the end. First, you go out about between six inches and a foot, depending how, on how big your, your branch is, and cut up from the bottom about a third of the way through your, the trunk. This seems counterintuitive, but it's very, very important. Okay, then you can go out to the six or eight inches out beyond that and cut down through the, through the branch completely and remove that. Now, if the branch is really big, going out way out there and heavy, you may want to take it off in sections beforehand so that you're not dealing with such a heavy piece of wood falling down. And you can cut that any, once you've got done this cut, you can do that straight through too. But once you get through to, to about here, and now you have only this piece to deal with, now you go back and just outside your branch collar, here's your branch collar, you cut down again and make a nice clean cut. And now you only, you're only dealing with a small piece of wood. If you do not do that, this is what's going to happen. This is a, a tree where the branch just broke off naturally and it broke, this is the branch breaking in half and then it stripped the bark off the wood, off the, off the tree all the way down to here. It's made a huge wound. Even if you take off the rest of this branch, which probably attaches, it's hard to tell, right, maybe right about there, you're still going to have this huge wound of exposed wood because of, um, because the, when the branch came off, it just tore all the way down. Here's another tree that's had the same thing happen. Now this tree is, is trying to heal itself seal itself right there. There's the, it's, it's the, the, the bark is beginning to grow over, but it's a very long process to, 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 um, for it to heal that, that size of a wound. And there's a lot of entry point for all kinds of insects and whatnot. So this is what you do not want. That's why you do the three point cut so that you don't strip the wood all the way down here. Branches are surprisingly heavy, and it's very, very easy for that to happen. It also helps you control the wood for your own sake, for your own safety, because you're not dealing with such a big branch. When you do that, anything would work like this, you should be very, very careful. Don't do branches that you can't reach yourself from the ground. If you have to stand on the ladder, call a professional, because this is can be dangerous work and we want you all to be safe. Okay, but that's the three cut method. Now the final thing we're going to tell you about trees and cutting trees is the one third diameter rule. This is when you're cutting bracket branch but you're not taking it all the way to the trunk. Trees are always pushing out sap which has the nutrients in the of uh, sugars for, for to, to help the tree grow from the, from the bottom, from the roots all the way out to the ends of the branches. If you cut this big branch out of here at this point, you will, um, you will direct all the sap that's been coming up this huge pipeline into this little tiny branch. It can't handle it. It's 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 not. It's just not uh, not going to work for the tree. You have to cut back to a branch that's at least and maybe more than one third of the size of your of the branch that you're cutting, so that it can handle that flow of sap and and nutrient. So when you're when you're cutting, you have to um, 
make sure you, this is a schematic, so it looks very weird, but um, you have to consider if you're only cutting the back of the branch a, a certain amount, how uh, that the branch that you're cutting to is big enough to handle the flow of sap. And you should probably be doing your three point cut on this branch too, so that you don't rip things so, down. Mm -hmm. There's a question about the previous slide that I thought we might go back to, and that is the, the question was, what is the purpose of cut number two? What is what? Go back one more slide. One more slide, yeah. Um, what is the purpose of the cut number two? What Could is you? the pur purpose of number two is to get rid of all this heavy wood so that you don't have to worry about it when you're cutting off at the branch collar. One of the, um, to and answer the question a little bit And if it rips here, it will only rip to this point and it will stop. This is your safety valve, your safety point. So that, it, so that if when you cut number two, you're, you're not, you, you only, if, 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 if the bark rips out down to here, that's as far as it will go. And then you can do a nice clean cut down here. Does that, does that explain it? Um, the, the, again, when you when you do cut number two, yep. and you have this all this weight outside that that initial cut, yep. you can yep. simply allow that cut to fall, that branch to fall without danger of damaging the rest of the tree. Yeah, because you've already done cut number one. Yeah, number one is 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 the safety block to to the to ripping the, the ripping the. Uh, bark down the trunk. Number two is removing the most of the large branch that you want to get rid of. And number three is removing the final piece of that branch and making a clean cut just outside the collar. It's very hard to cut neatly outside the bark collar as this branch is beginning to, is pulling off and it's starting to rip down and everything. You really can't do that comfortably. I hope that explains it. Okay, we're on the home stretch here. Thank you. <laughs> okay, no tree topping. This, this, whoops, this, I hope you can see the picture, it's right down at the bottom of the page. This is what happens when you, this is basically a, a heading cut multiplied 65 times because it's on a tree instead of on a little shrub. So what, imagine this, the, the this is what it looks like when you when you when you do it on a, on a on a hedge, but it doesn't look so bad. But when you do it on a tree, it looks terrible. They've just cut straight across the tree, with no consideration of where of going down to the next branch. They could have gone down here to the neck to the and, and taken it off here, or taken it off here if they wanted to reduce the size of a tree. It's not easy to reduce the size of a tree. That's not. You really need to plan how the size of the tree you want to have and buy appropriately rather than do something like this. But this is just about the world's worst thing to do to a tree. You've destroyed its leader, you've got destroyed most of its uh, nutrition system, and um, you will have a dead tree usually within several years. People do this to crate myrtles all the time. They're very, very hardy, energetic shrubs and they push back from it but it's an ugly thing to do and it's totally unnecessary. You can reduce the size of a tree without, or a shrub without doing that. Here they've taken out the, lop, the, the, um, the leader of the tree, which is, and also weakened it by, by putting a huge weight on either side without the central trunk. And this thing is not going to last very long. It's gonna have a sad and unhappy death. Okay. Okay, um, if you can't see out your windows, if you can't get down your driveway or your path, you have probably put the wrong plant in the wrong place and you need to either do major, major pruning or just start over. We don't need to put plants right up against our houses, number one. They don't get enough air circulation. Okay. Now, how to find more specific resources. 
with the, the pruning calendars and other Virginia Tech um, publications, you, if you just search on your, on your browser, extension ext.vt.edu, and then put in pruning, you will get, um, come up with a list of all of these and probably more. Or you can go to our website, mgnv.org, and there's a link there for Virginia, Tech, for Virginia Tech publications. And you can go to that link at the answer to search for pruning. So either one of those will work. We didn't put in actual links because we have learned to our sorrow that sometimes links get broken or out of date and then we've handed you something that is not effective. Um, or you can call up the help desk, which is always, always a useful thing to do and get specific help on a specific plant or a specific issue. Right now, so we generally have soil tests available all the time at our office, but that's closed right now. There are some available at Green Street Gardens Center at um, the corner of Quaker and Braddock Roads in Alexandria. And we've put some outside um, the building, the community center, Farrellington Community Center, where our office is, uh, at the back. You have to go around the back of the building. There's a little garden and we have some uh, test kits for you there too. And then also check our website because if we have more public education offerings like this, we will advertise them to you. And more questions. Yes, we have um, one question about David Austin roses. Okay. And, uh, David Austin roses that bloom off and on all summer. Mm -hmm. I usually prune them at 18 inches in February, but this year we missed doing okay. that. Okay. I'm thinking of pruning each cane individually after its first bloom in the next month or so. Does that make sense? Um, it does. But what you won't do is reduce the whole size of the plant. Bush, uh, shrub roses grow pretty vigorously, and so usually, yes, what people do is prune them about six to 18 inches from the ground in the late February, early, early March, just as they're beginning to break out, that you can see the, the leaf buds uh, starting to break out, which makes it very easy to uh, know where the buds are and what direction they're growing in and to approve above a bud that's growing toward the outside of the shrub, which is all useful. So you could do that. David Austin once said, well, they come in different sizes. Uh, Climbing roses are a little different, and I have to admit, I gave up on roses a long time ago, and I've never had a climbing rose. So I'm not really quite sure on the pruning requirements for them. But, there's, a request, there's a request, Molly, to move the slideshow back to the last two slides with the information for getting more help. Okay, no problem. Here we are. Is that good? And maybe one more that has the... Um, Oh, uh, well, hold on. One, two. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, anybody else have a question they can chat into the, put into the chat box. Um, and if you cannot do that, you can text the text it to Sydney or myself. Um, my phone number is in the chat box. I think we don't really have any other questions here. Okay. Well, we either did a really good or a really lousy job then. Uh, but <laughs> it's a pleasure doing this for you. I'm sorry, normally this presentation, this is only half of the presentation. We added some stuff because we couldn't go outside. Normally we do a quick overview of the calendar and the um, different types of cuts and the, the, the tree, you know, the, the, the tree uh, pruning things and then we go outside at a location and actual do actually do pruning which is very helpful I think for people so uh, maybe next year see if um, if we if we can be back in business then we'll be happy to do that with you okay okay but I would say this don't don't panic it's it's not as hard as it seems you can go outside and look at your plant and say it looks fine you can go outside and look at your plant and say it's got some dead branches and all you do is take those off and that's fine. 
you can look at it and say, well, it's got some dead branches and it's, maybe it's a little too much stuff in the middle. It looks awfully congested in the middle. So you take a few of those off and that's fine. But you can do it slowly. It doesn't all happen to happen in one day. You can walk around it, look at it from, it, from all sides and, um, and just do it carefully and slowly. And, that, and if you, worst case scenario, you cut it all the way back, you have a good chance it will grow again. Yep. Thank you. Um, everybody, I, stay safe. Be careful with your pruning tools. Um, I, I noticed that uh, if you have any trouble with picking up a saw test kit, you can always download the saw test um, uh, form from the Virginia Tech website and send a sample in that way with the form. You don't need to have the the official box or container to send it in. Um, simply put about a cup of soil into a container and mail it in with your form. Okay, lots and lots of Ari, so um, great job. Thank you to joined us today and Thank be sure to send your questions if you still have some questions to the Master Gardener Help Desk, M-G-A-R-L-A-L-E-X at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It's been a pleasure.